I'm very excited to be joined by such a wonderful panel today. Even though um, their names are behind me on a huge screen, I'm going to introduce them because that's what we agreed we would do. Um, I'm joined by Rianne King, Chief Executive of York Museums Trust, uh, Helen Ghosh, Director General of the National Trust, uh, Morag McPherson, uh, Head of Cultural Services Renfrewshire, and Maggie Appleton, Chief Executive Officer of the RAF Museum. So I guess I should talk about what we're going to do format-wise. We're going to speak to each of these excellent ladies individually about their organisations, then we're going to have a group discussion, and then there will be 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so do please save up your difficult questions. I'm within striking distance, so there's a limit of how difficult I can be. But you're <laughs> safe in the darkness. You can ask whatever you want. Um, so, Morag. Um, so I want to talk to you about Paisley 2021, the bid to mm -hmm. the UK City of Culture. And how you've, you know, I think there's a balance to be struck there between demonstrating a need for regeneration and championing a place as it already is. So how have you sort of navigated that, do you think? Yeah, um, so um, just to give a bit of context, for anybody who doesn't know, Paisley is a town just to the west of Scotland, um, population just under 80,000 or so. Um, a post-industrial town that over the last couple of decades has really kind of lost its way and its, its sense of itself as a centre of somewhere. Um, so the, the whole process of going through City of Culture, bidding for that um, UK City of Culture 2021 title has been really amazing. It's really galvanised um, the whole place and given a, a really refreshed and reinvigorated sense of purpose. But one of the things that we have, that we were advised with that was that in terms of winning the competition, that is the most um, difficult balance to strike, really. You have to be able to demonstrate um, the need and the impact that winning the competition would have. Um, and you also have to, obviously, um, demonstrate that you've got that spark and that momentum and the ingenuity to deliver it and make it happen. And I think that's it's probably a familiar balance to anybody who's answered that question on an HLF form. You know, what would you do <laughs> if you don't get the money? So you have to, you know, it's usually quite a straightforward answer to say, um, without the money, the project won't go ahead, but you also have to not look too pathetic and be able to demonstrate that you have got something that you, you know, your um, ingenuity and momentum will carry you forward anyway. So, so that's kind of, um, it's a difficult balance to strike, I think. Um, I think we can be confident that we've got really strong cases to make for both the need um, in terms of why we um, feel we need that huge catalytic step change of City of Culture. Um, Paisley has um, the most deprived area in Scotland um, within it. It has, um, I'll not go into what data zones are, but there's a Scottish yeah. system of data zones. Yeah. There's 23 data zones in Paisley that are within the 10% most deprived in Scotland. So, um, so there's a really strong case to make as to why we need that change. Mm -hmm. um, but also just what uh, the creative energy that's been unleashed over the past couple of years has been absolutely amazing mm -hmm. through the process and it's brought to light so much that we or that i think that we all didn't know was there um so the this the um the energy and the dynamism is mm -hmm. there and i think there's a feeling now there's a real buzz and a feeling that positive change will happen no matter mm -hmm. what but obviously we want it to happen on a really big exciting scale yeah yeah absolutely i think we'll probably come back to change yeah, and how museums yeah. can affect change later on the conversation so that's excellent um helen mm. uh you're leading a massive organization like i don't think there's anyone in the room that doesn't currently live or grew up near <coughs> something to do with the national trust <laughs> um so i thought it might be interesting to talk about you know the the how you can lead and affect change in something that so many people have a sense of yeah. ownership over and feel it there and feel very emotional about yeah um I just, to start off with, I'll just establish our credentials Do in the it, sense yeah. that some people, some people in the audience may be thinking the National Trust, a museum. <laughs> um, well, well, we are. We have, I think it's 140, more than 140 accredited museums across our places. Uh, so we're a big uh, is it museum authority, if that's the right term. Mainly acquired more or less by chance. I mean, we started off as a green organisation. Octavia Hill wanted green open spaces for the poor. And then we acquired, because it was a big conservation challenge in the mid-20th century, the houses and collections we look after. Um, and indeed, it's the houses and collections, the museum mm. element of what we do, mm. that's probably uh, most famous. Um, 
the, uh, there is a, a downside as well as an upside to being a big organisation like ours. Uh, we just hit 5 million members. Uh, we, get, we got last year about 24 million visits to our, what we call pay for entry, so our houses and gardens and parklands, the places that are uh, museums. Um, and, uh, you know, we still don't have enough money to spend on conservation, but nonetheless, you know, we are a, a thriving organisation. Um, everybody has an opinion about us, because we're such a big brand. Uh, the moment we try anything different, uh, somebody has an opinion, often played out on the front page of the Daily Mail or the Daily <laughs> Telegraph, and, you know, uh, the woman who cancelled Easter, or... Um, I think a really... I, know, uh, I feel threatened <laughs> just having you beside me. Who knows what she might do? I might cancel Christmas, folks, and then we can all save some time. I think we're quite grateful, all of us. But I think the uh, uh, Prejudice and Pride programme we ran... Well, we're still running in some of our places this year was the, the perfect example. Uh, what we were doing was telling a story, as all museums, m well, most museums uh, in this country have done one way or the other this year. And we were just telling the story about the links between our places and the people who lived in them and the issues around decriminalisation of homosexuality. But it was, it was like your maiden aunt had started wearing fishnet tights. I mean, it was just <laughs> extraordinary, the reaction we got. I have to say, we had fabulous support from the Museums Association. The director was out there writing to the paper and saying, you know, this is bonkers. Um, uh, and we got great support from people who thought this was exactly the way we should be moving. So I think the challenge for us, uh, given the brand, given the view that people have of us, uh, is how you continue to... Um, uh, give those audiences, the more traditional audiences, what they're looking for in terms of intellectual, spiritual, physical refreshment, but also reach out to larger audiences. Mm. We are absolutely, you know, we put our hands up and say, you know, the audiences we get, the membership we have, tends to be, it's too white, it's too middle class, it's too... Um, uh, actually, at, at either end of the spectrum, lots of young families, lots of older people, uh, not enough people in the middle, and in socio-economic terms, not diverse enough. So the, the real challenge for us is how we move from this place, given that kind of glare of attention to us, to a, 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 an organisation that genuinely, which is what our purpose is, uh, uh, gives benefit to the nation. Mm -hmm. and, wh and what do you think you've learned about that process, about how are you...? Um, I think you have to, I mean, if you take uh, the, uh, the parts of our LGBTQ programme that went very smoothly and successfully, uh, and those that cause more controversy, I think there's something very important, we'll probably get onto it later when we're talking about workforce, yeah. about taking your staff and your volunteers with you, yeah. so that the main, the people who your visitors meet when they come through the front door, uh, are completely with you on the journey yeah. um, and uh, we put our hands up and say you know in some of our places we didn't do that as well as we should have done uh, and in other uh, places we we did that well and took time and and patiently yeah. did it and then in the end you just have to keep saying um, you know this is our purpose reminding speaking over the people who are concerned to the wider nation and yeah. I think that's also key. Yeah. That bit of confidence is also key. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also we'll be picking up on a sense of purpose. Sense of purpose. And it's like we've planned it all wonderfully. <laughs> um, Rian, uh, so the York uh, Museum is undergoing a sort of massive uh, redevelopment. And I, one of the things that I thought was interesting in that was that it's not just about the museum building, it's also about the, the town in a wider way and the areas around you. And I wondered if you sort of feel like that's a thing that museums need to do more is... You know, if you want to be an asset for your community, that you have to think so much further outside of your building than maybe we traditionally did. Yes, I do think so. I mean, um, I should say, uh, we're not in the middle of that transformation. We're at the very early stages. So, but, that, but our vision is very much for the York Castle Museum, that it becomes, um, at the moment, any of you know York, York Castle Museum sits at the southern end of the city and is kind of the full stop to the end of the city. And through public consultation that the council has led, we know that people want walking routes along the river, which we could provide if we opened up and reorganised our land. And similarly, people want to be able to flow right through the city. Um, so whilst we started off with a capital project that was about a problem, which was to do with you know, internal museum things to do with access and lack of visitor facilities, we very rapidly developed into it being a really big vision for a different kind of museum that gives people choice about 
what they want to see, how they want to see it, but also that really is thinking hard about how it's making a place, so how we will um, play a pivotal role in the council's vision for that whole end of the city. And in fact, they've renamed the City Wider Generation Project after the castle now, where it was just called the Southern Gateway, it's now the Castle Gateway. Mm. Um, and so and I think that working, people think that because York Museum's Trust is well known as a trust, that we don't work really closely with the council, but we actually work very closely with the council, particularly on things like urban regeneration mm. um, and, and place making. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think yeah. for us, our purpose is actually our vision. Um, our charitable objective is to look after the collections and make them available and run education programmes and so on. Um, but those are all most hygiene factors. Our vision is to make York a world-class cultural centre mm -hmm. using our assets to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I worked at the Design Museum just before they relocated and I was really surprised by how much of it was about placemaking and working. And you know, often local authorities are very excited to have museums there as like a cultural asset. And, 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 but it's also a compromise and sometimes they're doing things that as a museum you don't necessarily support. And it's, it's, it, is a, it's a, it is a really interesting um, integration of kind yes. of arts and culture and civic space. Mm. Yes, it really is. And I think what it's enabled the council to do is We've worked with them on lots of um, sort of walkabouts the city with um, both special interest groups and the public and so on. And because we've been able to bring in the kind of heritage stories, um, it's actually attracted people to it as a kind of event rather than just consultation on plans. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're working the other way up, really, sort of starting to work with the University of Leeds um, and commissioned by the City Council to do lots of grassroots um, consultation around what do people want to see, ha see happen in this area. And we haven't even begun doing any drawings or anything because we want to find out first what are the, what are the objectives for, for local people in terms of how we develop that end of town. Yeah, definitely. And that's about sort of listening to different audiences we're yeah. getting into. Um, Maggie, um, so you are obviously at the RAF Museum and you're also undergoing a sort of big redevelopment and whenever we spoke about it, you sort of spoke about it as moving from being a museum that's about objects, big planes, to being a museum that's more about social history. So I thought it might be interesting to sort of find out a little bit more about how that came about and also I'm, I imagine there have been people who are really up for this change and then people who don't feel quite so thrilled about it and how are you bring everyone along with you. Mm. And I, yeah, I guess the first thing is that change takes time. It sounds like we're all, you know, we want to get things moving and get things changed, but there's also a bit of understanding that. Although I, I, I think probably many of us and most of us have seen that a capital transformation really helps bring that cultural yeah. change along with it because that feeling of things moving on just really helps psychologically mm -hmm. in some ways. So at the Royal Air Force Museum, it's actually 100 years next year since the RAF was founded. So it's, it's really about celebrating and commemorating and, and marking that with a transformation that's mainly based on at our London site, some at our West Midland site as well. And that was very much about actually the fact that our Cosford site is much more visitor engaging in its physicality now. We've got fabulous Cold War um, gallery in there. So it was about the need really being there at the London site and being very haphazard. But the, the vision really came from trustees and before my time, I've been there nearly three years and it was probably a couple of years before that that our new chair of trustees really took trustees often as a new chair comes in and does that saying, well, what we're here for, what we're doing. And I think, you know, their feeling was we had slipped into being a bit of a museum of aircraft with technical panels yeah. and actually... With the Royal Air Force Museum, we're, we're there to tell stories of the RAF and its people yeah. through our amazing collections, which isn't just about aircraft, though, yeah. you know, the tyranny of the big object, they do tend to be a bit in your <laughs> face, a great 250 photo, yes. account. Like a PR, it you know, it's hard does. to resist. <laughs> Absolutely. So really it came from there in terms of, you know, actually we should be thinking about how our objects really sing and tell stories. And it all really came from there. And actually then the capital change was really led by that piece of thinking and you know your, your your question I guess about bringing people with us in terms of that storytelling and my background as a social history curator I'm not a military historian by any means but 
I, I think often we underestimate our colleagues who've been there an awful yeah. long time as well. Because yeah. we, yeah. absolutely, because one of, one of our values as an organisation, and actually define your values together as a team, really really helps bringing that mm -hmm. together. But one of our values is passion, mm. and of course, our, some of our colleagues have been there for years and years. They of course they love the collection, love the objects, but over time, of course, they're the ones that have heard those stories and haven't had opportunities to tell them before. And, and so that opportunity, I think, you know, almost to a man and woman, we stand together on that. Mm -hmm. I guess often where the trickiness comes is, um, some of it's about how you tell the stories, but again, that shouldn't be us as curators or interpreters. It's about, back to our, our or audiences, for want of a better word, it does feel one way, that doesn't it? But, um, you know, who actually are the people who are coming now, let alone who could come? And, and actually that powerful statistic has found that 7% of our visitors, only 77% are the specialists who come because okay. they're interested in aircraft or the Royal Air Force. Actually, people come because we're a free national museum and yeah. it's a great place to go yeah. with your kids. Uh, that's why I started going many years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's like days out vibe. It, yeah. Absolutely, and actually, you know, m most, if not all of our team really get that, that actually if we're really going to share our amazing stories effectively, we've, we've got to think about how we're sharing them appropriately to broaden that audience. Mm -hmm. So, so that's helped. All these things, I think, help create that narrative of us working together, pulling those values together as a team and, and actually the behaviours we expect from each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I guess, you know, just before I say uh, the uh, lovely fluffy thing that I am going to say, you know, what, what none of us should put up with is negative, disruptive people who drag everything down. We need yeah. great HR processes, of course, to do that. But I just think, I, I just think often it feels more intellectually um, uh, clever and we get more gravitas by being critical when mm. actually I think being positive should be what we are about people yeah. because there is so much amazing good in people. And actually, um, you know, back to Helen, if, if we're bringing everyone with us, it's much more effective. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. rather than bashing and dragging, you know, actually let's just pull together and don't get me wrong, that's tough and it takes time, but yeah. I think we should love people into moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Hey, for something in front of the fog. Yeah, I actually I heard a speech by um, some people in the room might know him, Richard Watts, who uh, leads people make it work, who are a change consultancy, and he was talking last week, and he said, you know, a if you have faith in people, it'll really surprise yep. you by what they can achieve, and also like nobody likes being changed, but people are quite happy to change. Yeah. And if you uh, yeah. give people space to do it yeah. themselves, you know they're much less resistant. <laughs> um, which is. Interesting. Um, so this is a bit where I'm just hoping it's going to be like a massive free for all, the four of you. <laughs> um, We're talking on top of each other. Yeah, yeah totally. That. That's sorry, the poor person who's transcribing. Um, so I thought the first thing we could talk about was would be collections. Yeah. So obviously, this is sort of guided by the themes of the conference. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to sort of start at this point where I think as museums, we no longer think that our collections are just going to be what rich people happen to leave us behind and taking a more you know, active approach to collecting and defining where you want your collections to go. And then a lot of that becomes you know, reaching out to communities and asking them and different audiences and asking them what they want to see in the museum. But where do you put the museum voice in that and how do you stop it from becoming, you know, for want of a better phrase, like just a collection of people's knickknacks? Can I, can, I, can I make it even more complicated? Please. Because I may be in a slightly different <laughs> position. No, perhaps I'm not in a slightly different position. So uh, I think this question of the collection, and for us, what is the collection and what is significant, is particularly challenging. So we have, I mean, in a sense, what our USP, I suppose, I'm sure there are people from museums in this room who would say they have the same one because the historic building with the historic collection. But our USP is it's a collection that came within a particular place, a particular house, in a garden, in a landscape. So it's, it's, it's there. You haven't, it hasn't been drawn in from lots of other places. So it's indigenous. Um, and all of the collections that we have, well, most of the collections we have are a kind of mix we just acquired often thanks to the, the taxpayer, uh, these places. And they came with, in some cases, what you might describe as... No, I won't, because it'll appear on the front page of the Daily Mail. Is there anyone from the Daily Mail in? The Woolworths lampshade, you know, the things that they, the family happened to leave in the house when they left, and the, you know, the stubs on the wall and the Chippendale furniture. And um, so, in one sense, if what we are doing is, is 
presenting and wanting to present one way or another, we'll get onto this, you know, a, a living place, a, a, a pro something that looks like a private home, then the scrubbing brush or the Woolworths lampshade is in theory as significant as the stubs. And that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, um, you can solve this problem by thinking of what is the story you want to tell. But frankly, there are places where I think the collection might be weeded a little mm. uh, in order to say, you know, is this particular Woolworths lampshade particularly valuable? Uh, and given the conservatorial resource that you've got, you simply can't look perfectly after everything. So we have that. Uh, and then we have the issue about and what are the stories you choose to tell? And what's the relevance of the objects you've got in your collection mm. for the stories you want to tell? Um, and very often that isn't about the stubs on the wall. Though some of our visitors will want to come and see the stubs and the Chippendale and, uh, and the mice and, and whatever. Um, it's moving to a world where you're telling the story about, you know, the money on which the house, from which the house was built or the mm. colonialism or whatever, slavery, if that's where the money came from. So we also need to look at significance. That's the kind yeah. of third significance from us, which is kind of the community. Yeah. It's not the community bringing object, but it is how we then use the collection we happen to have ended up with. Yeah, I think a different interpretation to tell the slant story. on the same object, yeah. so to, using it in a different context. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And um, in terms of collections and collection, again, we're going through a big collections review mm. that is all about relevance, which is another of our yes. values, plain values bingo here. Um, we should have a board. We <laughs> should be sticking them up. <laughs> and and it, it is about, you know, actually we have collected over the years objects that aren't relevant to telling our story. So that's part of it. But part of it really for us as well, and I know for many of us working in museums, is making sure that we're up to date with our collecting as well. Because the, the stories of today, it just as it Lem say it was the chat from Bargain Hunt that fed into Lem yeah. conversation earlier. <laughs> it is actually thinking about our collections today and making sure that we're representative now as well. Mm -hmm. So actually that... We are telling those stories powerfully. Of, for us, it's only 100 years of history, which is easier, <laughs> easier than, than some of you. But, and and, and it is, it's back to the relevance word for mm. me. And there's something about um, the participatometer, which is a made-up word. Mm. But, in, you know, in terms of that curation or collecting or whatever, that, that you know, the, the, the community and the objects and the curator there's something in the middle isn't it it's not throwing it all to one side of yeah. the swingometer or the other actually the powerfulness is where you've got the community buy-in but and the specialist and yeah. the curator working together in a powerful way so it, it shouldn't be one or the other it yeah. should be close harmony between yes. the two Yes. I like this powerful. I feel like balance mm. is like a really unsexy topic, mm. but it's actually Shall we like, make it like balance, we make it balance yeah. is magic. Uh, yeah. So yeah, let's just start saying powerful and like that. Yeah. Go with it. And I think oh. the, uh, the visibility of collecting mm. as a process is really important to that as well, because collections have for so long been held behind closed doors, you know, in mm. old barracks and sheds and mm. wherever, that um, it's quite difficult, I think, for the public to get a a grasp on what we would be thinking about in terms of how we build and develop collections. So there's obviously been quite a few moves over the past few years to have um, publicly accessible museum stores. Mm. And we're in the process of um, opening one in the next, over the next few weeks. Um, the decant is ongoing at the moment. And we think it's a UK first, so I'm sure somebody will tell us if it's not, that it's actually on the High Street in Paisley. Oh, nice. So it's the old basement of the, what was the Littlewood mm. store. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself will be really interesting because it'll be very central to that place. It'll have a High Street entrance. Obviously, people will still have to book and make arrangements mm. to come in and go on a tour and so on. But... I, I think there'll be some there'll be a lot of learning for us in that in terms of people understanding what collections are, why we've got them. And I think in in those types of facilities people ask a lot of questions like why do we keep these yeah. types of things? Yes. You know, so I think opening up that whole process and allowing people to kind of come into the question as to mm. what we've got collectively and why we've got it and who decides and you know, how do we um as you say, maybe after a period of time, decide that things aren't so interesting. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think I think having a kind of more public space that you can do that in. And really how are you helps. going to present it? Well, it's basically they're functional stores, so, so you know you go into the art store racks. and it's you know the um, arts on racking, or you go into the ceramic store and the ceramics are in cabinets. Um, but it's 
you, I suppose you don't want to over design a facility like that. Yeah, but I wonder if there'll be like yeah. a new aesthetic of yeah, storage display yeah. in I mean, the future. It could be, all. It could be. <laughs> Our equipment um, on this is the attic. You know, yeah, the, the attic yeah. full of those things. Yeah. Well, it's designed as a as a public experience as well. Yeah. So we've worked with um, an architecture company called Collective Architecture. So they're they're quite well established now in Scotland, but they're still young enough to be young and funky. Mm -hmm. So it kind of brings a different aesthetic to that type of space, and I think a different aesthetic to the high street as mm -hmm. well. So. It will be really interesting just to see how the public respond. I think people sometimes, so I worked in museum press offices, which is why I'm here, but um, I think I always used to get TV producers being like, can we come and film in the stores? <laughs> and I think they thought it would be some kind of like Indiana Jones esque <laughs> event. And museums are just like packed with treasures that we never bother putting on display. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, all the good stuff's out, seriously. I mean, <laughs> unless it's being conserved. Um, so I, I always felt it was very unfair on the curators who had worked so hard to create these lovely <laughs> <laughs> exhibitions and galleries, and people just want to like film the roller racking. <laughs> it is quite fascinating. So. Yeah. I'd, I'd really like to pick you up on um, what you said about knickknacks and yeah. mm. wooden knickknacks. That's <laughs> me being provocative. Yeah, yeah because um, in a way, the York Castle Museum was exactly collected by Dr. Kirk, who was a doctor in North Yorkshire, and he used to um, go around. He, he felt that his way of life that he knew as an old, when he was an old man, he was looking back and seeing shops and objects that he felt were passing from use. Um, so he developed this terrible reputation, which is he'd go and treat a patient and um, pe people would start hiding their favourite things <laughs> because, because they, they'd say, oh, we haven't got enough money to pay you. And he'd say, that's OK, can I just have that thing there? Um, so, so this is sort of an apocryphal story, but we're, we've got an hour anniversary coming up. We're hoping to ask the public mm. across Yorkshire, do you have any real stories that you're pretty confident about, about how Dr oh. Kirk did acquire all this stuff? So, so it's a kind of museum of knickknacks in, in terms yeah. of how it started. And for me, that's what makes it special, and that's what makes it relevant and accessible, because mm. we have, you know, 30,000 costume items, but what's special about those costume items is that they range from, you know, Queen Victoria's morning gown, but they range also to very everyday um, pieces of clothing, and pieces of clothing that ordinary people wore. Mm. And so mm. the collection across all of its different areas, the social history areas, covers lots of different classes, and that's probably because of Dr Kirk and the way he went around collecting mm. in yeah. this very... <laughs> a slightly odd way um, and then the collection has grown since then um, but one of the things that people really love about the castle museum is that it's it's from a museological perspective it's a bit crazy you know you mm. kind of go around you think <gasps> there's no proper visitor route and you know and and actually the feedback that we get is people love that they love the kind of craziness of it so the big challenge for us in our development is how do we keep that magic and that quirkiness um, whilst resolving some of the issues that really are there museologically. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important not to, uh, not to kind of um, get too obsessed with the single narrative. So I think we yeah. feel yeah. it's all about lots and lots mm. of stories um, and lots of different ways in mm -hmm. for different people. And also I'm really interested in getting um, the public to actually look at the collections and tell us what their associations are with the collections as much as actual facts about the collections. Because I think listening to our visitors, that's what people talk about, is they talk about what seeing a Terry's chocolate orange or, or, or finding out that there was a Terry's chocolate apple once upon a time. What, <laughs> what, what that makes them think about yes. is you know, their yeah. relationship to chocolate. And, Mm -hmm. And actually, I think those things are important to capture, yeah. um, as well as the kind of hard facts. And so we're, we're struggling with that at the moment, and how to, how to get more and more of that going. And I think it relates to the conversation we had offline about rationalisation and really knowing your projects. And I, I really welcome the emphasis on collections management and storage and funders looking at supporting that in the um, Mendoza report, because yeah. we are finding that we have this vast collection and actually, we need more people to go through. And if we knew our, our collection better, there are got, there've got to be stories in there that we haven't found yet. Um, and I, I can't believe we're the only museum that's in that situation. You're definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's back to that balance again about um, projecting authority and admitting that you need some help. Like, I yeah. think a lot of museums yeah. don't know everything that they've got, but really don't feel like they can be very public about that. Yeah. Maybe we should all yeah. just have like an amnesty. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. But yeah. Okay, well, should we, should we move on to audiences? Mm -hmm. That's Scott's collection sorted in that 10 minutes. That's <laughs> more to say. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there's loads of, loads of stuff to talk about with audiences, mm. but again, to sort of kick us off, because I feel like, you know, we can't go half an hour without someone mentioning Brexit. 
um, was, was that sort of Brexit moment when I feel like a lot of people in the artistic community generally and in museums um, felt very bruised by what was going on in the country. Like we all thought that everyone loved us and thought we were brilliant and everyone thought just like us. Mm. Uh, it turns out they don't. And um, that the very people that a lot of us are really trying to reach in terms of new audiences and people that maybe don't come to the museum lots. And then also some people who do come to the museum lots who we thought were totally on side, that they don't really necessarily agree with us or think like us. And, you know, as a workforce, we tend to sort of think a certain way and sort of, how do you bridge those divides? Like, how do you start talking to people once you realise that you really see the world very differently? Mm. I, think, I, think, I think one one of the things I think we need to think about is think about that in the same way that we think about other community yeah. engagement. You know, um, gone are the days, hopefully, where museums just sort of said, we're, we've, we're doing this project and you'll love it, really. Um, actually, what we have to do is go out into communities, understand what makes them tick, and then think about how there's a relevance in our collections or in our sites. And it seems to me that that's what we need to do yes. with, with a, this same audience. And and I think it does require a bit of rethinking. So we launched um, for the first time last summer um, the York Proms. And as I was walking around through everybody picnicking and singing the national anthem, I suddenly thought, oh, this is, this is the Brexit. Or, you know, this is, this, these are the people we need to actually get from out into our gardens, into the museums and yeah. think about. So, so one of the things that we need to think about going forward is how we do um, capture the enthusiasm of that audience for what we're doing there and use that to open up a dialogue, and that's, that's a bit of work that we can do. And, and I think there's got to be lots of other ways in that you can find to um, start those conversations. Mm -hmm. mm. And, I mean, absolutely picking up that point, not assuming that you know what it is that will draw them in. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the issues that we grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's an initial... Uh, it's almost back to your, the discussion you were having about collections. You know, for us, given the nature of our collections, our museums. You know, we're all the time struggling, and there's lots to learn from lots of people and, and museums represented in this room about how you get the layering right so that you're still appealing to the cognoscenti at one end and the person who's never stepped inside uh, one of our houses before in their lives. Um, so you've got to start with, how would I present these different stories? And one thing we've discovered just from doing various kind of focus group type stuff, but going out into communities, is you assume that if you started telling a story about, let's say, colonialism, mm. you know, that would draw a particular audience. Whereas when we asked that question uh, up here, actually, in Manchester, most of the people we spoke to said, no, that, we don't want to hear about that. We want to hear about industrial, the, the history of the Northwest and its industrial heritage. You think, mm -hmm. ah, now I made an assumption there. So mm -hmm. going Absolutely. out and asking yeah. people mm -hmm. must be one of the, the primary uh, things that you do. But um, uh, as I say, getting the techniques so that, you know, we, certainly for us, the big challenge is how you can. Um, and museums, often other museums do it terrifically well convey information and aim at a lot of audiences at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's one of our biggest challenges. Hmm. I think there was um, Brexit, the decision, and then there was Brexit, the whole tone of the yeah. argument and yeah. debate, and especially a lot of the anti-immigration <laughs> rhetoric, mm -hmm. that was a, you know, a lot of which was incredibly vitriolic, I think, might have knocked museums' confidence a little bit in terms of um, trusting in the wisdom of crowds. Yeah, exactly. You know, so um, previously, maybe when we've dealt with kind of issue-based um, content, and there's maybe been to us a, an unpalatable view as part of that sort of issue or, or argument, I think we've been we've had quite good general skills at presenting that view and being able to frame it and. Um, and trust that there's maybe a wider view that can, um, if you like, understand and yeah. sort of interpret that. And I think that um, museums are maybe less confident about um, opening up um, a space for public debate where there could be a lot of very vitriolic mm -hmm. or vehement mm -hmm. views expressed. And I think dealing with that is not insurmountable, but it's maybe more of a specialist skill mm -hmm. in yeah. our sector. It's not a general skill. I think most people would feel underconfident in terms of knowing what to do. Yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't mean that we, sh we should then shut down the debate or shut down that space. But I think it's probably um, us working towards understanding what skills do you need to be able to yeah, deal with the consequences yeah. Yeah. of how that develops and also participate in it. Mm. Um, one of the 
um, things I've been involved in over recent years and I saw um, Piotr and Regis uh, who were involved in the Paul Hamlin Our Museum programme. Um, that, was a that asked a lot of interesting questions of um, museums um, and in particular I think it really identified that museums don't often enter into the debate or involve mm. themselves in the debate, they're at a remove and they present and host a, a debate but don't really get involved. So I think there's a, there's a lot to unpack in that, I don't think there's mm -hmm. easy answers mm -hmm. but I think developing those skills and that mm. understanding of yeah. how to really engage is really important because people see where they're not allowed or their, their expression isn't welcome and they just turn their backs and yeah. walk away. Yeah. 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 I mean one of the things we've learned is that despite you know the brilliant staff that we have and the volunteers that we have we're most successful when we do those things in partnership with other people mm -hmm. with universities with yeah. other museums uh, uh, and what we're experimenting with, which is trying to tell some of those big national stories, is a series of, you know, every year, not at all of our places, but at a selection of places, as with our Prejudice and Pride programme, let's see if we can pull that kind of partnership together to, to tell stories at a number of our places. So, you know, this year coming, uh, we'll be doing women and power and suffrage. Uh, we'll be doing radical landscapes, which is just relevant here because of the Peterloo massacre and so on. Uh, but that thing about doing it in partnership, so A, you're kind of not on your own, but also you know that the basic information, the facts that you're putting out there are as good as they could possibly be. Um, and so in a sense, you can't have the attack. You couldn't be attacked for, this is political. No, this is based on absolutely excellent evidence presented by the best possible people. Mm -hmm. You know, that is one way, as it were, slightly to manage the risk of going into that kind of quasi-political debate mm, around, mm. you know, the future of the mm. country or yeah. the future but, of society. Yeah, that, that model, though, is still, it's kind of broadcast model, isn't it? Yeah, it, so it I is. So I suppose the question is more where you're providing a platform for involvement and for people to, um, to voice their own views. I think the, that's maybe, I, all I'm suggesting is I, I think that Brexit's knocked our confidence a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's how yeah. it feels like yeah. it was a difficult, yeah. we all thought we were heading in a direction and yeah. like, well, I think it has and it hasn't, because I think what it has shown is the importance of the work that we do, you know, in terms yeah. of yeah. telling the truth about the history of Britain actually being very diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the evidence for those stories, and I think we might have felt that everyone gets that now, and actually we were reminded, no, they don't. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if you picked up on the Ferrari with Mary Beard when she was talking oh, about, yes. you know, um, black people in Roman Britain. Yes. We've had um, someone we call that Ivory Bangle Lady, who was a North African Roman woman on display with all her jewellery mm. um, for, you know, for ages. And that's never been an issue. And then suddenly you get um, people suggesting that this is somebody making it up, somebody as eminent as Mary Beard making it up. And so I think it really proves that we have to tell the story Keep yeah. pushing I think, yeah. um, the hidden histories and bringing out the authentic tell truth them well and, and, and tell make them, them well yeah based on that yeah. if, if not mary beard who really yeah. authentic scholarship yeah. that's yeah. right so i think it i think it actually gives us more determination because yeah. it shows that we still need to do that yeah too. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right and i th you know we've all held our heads in our hands a little bit i'm worried about i mean some of the things sharon was talking about right at the outset in terms of that you know that whole what he's doing to, to society at the moment which absolutely is to your point about them, how what we're doing is more important um I, I, and i think you know the worry is though that we mustn't lump people as oh well that's what a brexit to your yeah, exactly. voter looks like because none of us are, are just you know yeah. one single person or you know mm. you're you, know, you might be a woman or a working class woman, working class woman who works in museums and love museums, a cat lover, you know, so they're not just a Brexit person, that's it, they're all, they're, you know, yeah. each and every one, and there may be some in this room, we're all different people with multiple yeah. uh, parts of us. I've just got to share with you, though, the most amazing cartoon that um, a former very senior RAF person sent me after that, because we'd had the, <laughs> that moment together, and it was one in... A lot of you have seen that. It's a very famous, lots of famous um, photographs of a pilot scrambling to the yeah. Spitfires just to set off to, you know, uh, save Britain in, in the Battle of Britain. And it says on this cartoon, bloody Pauls coming over here saving <laughs> our women and children. And it just <laughs> summarised it fabulously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People find I it hard to let go of 
or you know, this thing, people find it quite destabilizing to let go of it, a story of themselves yes, that they've yeah, been yeah. told. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes we're like, no, it's so exciting and different from but what you imagine, but they find that quite threatening. I think it is also just worth saying that to vote for Brexit, I didn't vote for Brexit, but I think for it's worth saying that to vote for Brexit, there might have been multiple reasons. Yes, yes right. Right. there were lots of different reasons. Europe isn't perfect, and so you know we'd be quite careful about not making the assumption that it's going to drive us into polarisation about yeah. people who did vote for Brexit. Back to faith in people. Yeah. There's lots yeah. of reasons not to I vote. So. Yeah, not to vote to remain. Excellent. Um, so workforce is one of the uh, big themes of the conference, obviously. So I thought it would be interesting to quickly talk about that. And then I promise we will be going to questions. So I hope you're thinking about questions, guys. Um, which is that obviously there's not a lot of money around. Uh, work again museum is not the fast track to riches. Um, you know, but how do we make or continue to, uh, you know, have museums as great places to work? And I think it would be remiss of me not to point out that we're doing directors in conversation and I'm sitting here with four women directors and maybe you know looking at that through the lens of leadership and those top roles and how we think of those top roles and just before we came on we were you know I was sort of saying I sort of think there's still once you get to a certain point this idea of the lone genius leading <laughs> the organization forwards and you know why do we still think that when well, we all know we work in teams yeah. and yeah. why why aren't more you know being a director is a big old job like why don't more people job share it that seems that it would be a much nicer way to tackle that life so do you have any sort of thoughts on that how we can I met two amazing uh, women a couple of weeks ago who were doing um, a job share role and they were uh, talking about leadership with me and saying, oh, well, you know, we've both got to. And I said, well, why don't you apply for a job together? Yeah. As a, you know, they're doing, they've worked together, they've got amazing track record doing incredible things together. And I think, you know, it is part of that whole, uh, interesting, the recruitment guidelines that the MA is going to be producing next following the salary survey. Actually, you know, we just need to be a bit more open-minded don't we? And, you know, I said to you, they were two people who've got, actually, between them, a massive combination of skills and, and, and you know, and do you know what? We're still so rubbishly, aren't we, backward in terms of what work looks like today. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, the question, of course, is how we get through that. And I think it needs leadership across the sector just being more open-minded and perhaps something will come through the recruitment guidelines to encourage people to be more open-minded about what great leadership looks like and how to bring more skills and diversity and different thinking and it's mm. back to you know just having teams that all think the same way and actually mm. we need that diversity of people in it if we're really going to be creative if we're really going to be representative yeah, yeah. i think um also you know, it's very unfortunate that um, when budget cuts or pressures come along, one of the first things that, that people think of cutting is training mm. because it's sort of, mm. you know, it's sort of expendable. But actually, I think I would argue it's really not expendable. And, you know, we, we may not be able to offer the highest salaries in the world, but most people who join museums are really passionate about what they do. They really want to know more. They really want to be good at their job. And so we can... Um, support them by offering much more in the way of training and I think also if you want to, to do effective culture change then empowering your people to feel that they can be the best at their job is the most you know is a really key part of that, yeah. that mm -hmm. culture yeah. change I yeah. think so I think that's I mean, be my uh, plea. I, I feel you know I'm slightly embarrassed at this point in the sense that we don't rely on public funding so some of the issues much under debate uh, around the Mendoza report don't apply to us um, and thanks to the support, you know, the growing support, um, we've been able to invest more in, for example, curatorial posts, which is great, uh, and the other kind of technical skills we need for our conservation and presentation. Um, but we do face the issue of how we make our workforce, and indeed our volunteers, who are at significant, about 25% of our workforce in labour terms, look more like the communities mm. we want to serve. Um, and so, for example, you know, in, the, in recruiting new curatorial posts, uh, particularly when they're around kind of social history uh, issues uh, and industrial history issues, how do we learn from you and how do we play our part in, in, in training the next generation to make them look more like the communities they serve? 
Um, and I think you know, that's one, one of our greatest challenges. I, th I happily, uh, because we're such a dispersed organization and you know, people are traveling around and working here and there and everywhere, um, I think you know, there is quite a lot of flexible working in the organization mm -hmm. and quite a lot of uh, certainly senior women um, and managers in the organization. Not, uh, not enough, as I said earlier, from uh, ethnic, in terms of ethnicity mm -hmm. and socioeconomic diversity. But I do think there's something for us all to do as, as, as an industry. Is it an industry? As a movement? As a as a, as, um, as sector in in uh, uh, our lives, to work together on how we develop the next generation to look to look like the communities we serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one powerful way I think that we can think about that is actually roots through across and up the, our uh, organisations yes. as well because you know how many of us have got amazing front of house visitor experience people mm, yeah. who actually know the job know the stories are incredible and and i just think that there's something there that we really need to um, appreciate and make more opportunities to actually be able to it shouldn't be just because you're coming in with the you know, and it's important, of course, our, our, our training is important, but you shouldn't just be able to come in, walk in with a bucket full of degrees and do the job. And actually, there are people who've never had that opportunity, often are from the community and have the ability yes. yeah. or the ways of supporting through that yeah. way. Yeah. I think we can Create do a lot pathways. more thinking about yeah. that. Definitely a huge issue in class diversity. Massively. Yeah. Well. Massively. yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, unfortunately, over the last few years, I think a lot of local authorities in particular yeah. um, training budgets have, have just disappeared. So I think it, there'll be a lot of museums and they, they won't be represented here today where it's just become endemic now, really, that there is no training and development. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really difficult nut to crack. I think there's the potential to obviously learn from each other and um, to form clusters and so on. But that still takes developmental resource of some kind, mm. you know, even if it's a, on yeah. a regional level, somebody somewhere has to coordinate that. Um, and I think there's probably a lot we could be learning from other sectors as well. Um, libraries in particular, I think, have been mm. very interesting in terms of how they have flexed over the last kind of couple of decades, really, in terms of their purpose. Um, so I think there's, you know, imaginative training models yeah. that we need to look mm -hmm. at in terms of offering development opportunities. But absolutely, echo Maggie's point about front of house staff. I think that um, a lot of front of house staff have amazing skills and get stuck, yeah. and there's not really a route to, to, for the, for them to develop, and also for the organisations to that they that employ them to really. Um, be able to make the most of the skills that they already yeah. have. Yeah. Often a very yeah. untapped resource. Yeah. 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 There's still very much a blind spot, I think, yeah. in, in yeah. museums in terms of organisational development. Yeah, and also in like planning, you know, in planning like, other times that, you know, new galleries or a new exhibition mm. and the front of house staff are like, yeah, we knew that corner would never work. Yeah. yeah. You know? Because <laughs> like, they stood there and looked cause, at it. Yeah, because yeah. they, you know, they know where like buggies have to go and yeah. people move How around. How people move around and what like they the, look at you know, and what they're interested in. The, uh, yeah. You know, the inconvenient actuality yeah. of people in a space rather than how we imagine they behave. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we are now entering question time. There are, I can see two microphones. So I think you have to go and stand behind the microphones. While you're doing that, I did do a shout out for questions on Twitter because so 2017. And um, <laughs> Sharon Hale got back and said that I should ask you all, how does your museum make a difference? So that's like an easy one that you can just like shoot <laughs> off while we're waiting for people to get to the microphones. That's, that's an interesting question for us. We're on the verge of undertaking a 42 million pound redevelopment of Paisley Museum. And um, we're about to recruit a co-production officer um, who is going to develop our collective methodology around co-production. And we're interviewing with somebody from a local, um, the third sector interface. And she said she'd been speaking to somebody who'd said, well, what will it do for me? And so I think that's a real central question um, in terms of thinking about our museum redevelopment and um, for the people who are most vulnerable or most excluded in our society to think what what will it do for them? And it's, it's not an easy question mm -hmm. to answer. Quite a lot of the impacts or um, achievements of those types of projects are projected uh, in a way that's very indirect. So it's about mm -hmm. numbers of jobs created and so on, but that's not a very, it's not a particularly direct impact. Yeah. Um, so I think the ongoing engagement um, and being seen as the, I suppose, this sort of a central focus for a place, being a, a mm -hmm. place, a museum being a space that people can come mm -hmm. to express what a place is to them and what it means to them, is really important. But there's just so much work to actually pull together 
the mechanisms and the ways of working that really get that reach and yeah. that sort of depth and substance to your relationships with people. Yeah. Mm. Just picking up on spaces as well, our transformation of the our London site next year is uh, where we are in North London, parks are just being built on left, right and centre for yeah. housing. Mm -hmm. And we're creating a new green space at the middle of the site. And, and really for us, it's the excitement of being able to be, as well as a national museum, a proper community space where people can come in. It's a free museum. Uh, our great team are doing engagement to encourage people to come in now because actually there's a whole psychology, as we know, about whether you go through the doors or not. But that fabulous green space for people to come in. Do you know what? I don't care whether people just come in because they think they're coming in for a nice cup of tea and they sit in our lovely space because actually we will engage them. They will not leave without yeah. getting excited. And, and that whole space making and place making yeah. is a, yeah. a it's massive a massive one. thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sorry, Maggie uh, sort of triggers what I think my answer to the question would be, which is, um, I, I mean, in one sense, and I have, however many it is, you know, if you, beyond the accredited museums, 500 places people might go, uh, and they'll go there for extraordinarily different reasons. Mm. Um, and in a sense, we shouldn't dictate to them what mm -hmm. they go there for, whether it's they just want a lovely to sit in a garden and listen to the bees, or whether they want so, to go and walk on one of our fells, or whether they want to go inside the house and engage with the collection. Um, we don't, I mean, I, I, I do think there is, while you want, we want to say, you know, it's up to you to choose what you do, you know, naturally, and you would all feel this as museum directors, you actually long for them to go inside <laughs> the house, which actually, at almost all our places, it's less than 50% of our visitors do that. We long for them to go inside and share our excitement. Um, what we know is that when we do the kind of Alva surveys, um, you know, they have, a, they have a good day out, they quite like the cafe, da 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 The thing we are still not doing well enough is triggering that in emotional engagement. Mm. So I think this issue for us about how you trigger just, just what, the spark, just come in for five minutes, look at half a dozen of our lovely things, just to see whether if we presented differently, we kind of brought things off the walls, mm -hmm. if we, mm -hmm. you know, isolated, put some things, some things from the collection, uh, presented in a different kind of way. How can we get that emotional connection, yeah. tell stories better, connect people in that way yeah. with yeah. our things? That's what I hope we can achieve. I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's a hard question because there are so many different ways in which we make a difference. So there's economic impact. Our impact is £15 million pounds a year or so yeah. on York. Um, place making, which is really important. And it's not just the physical ways that we can make place, but also the ways that we help people relate to their places and understand the places that they're mm. visiting or walking about in every day that much better. And we know from consultation that people do want to know that. Mm. Um, and then there's cultural well-being and social well-being. Yeah. We've, ju we've just started working with the City Council adult social care team on cultural prescribing to tackle loneliness. Um, and there's so many bits of work of that kind going on at museums. And so we do all of these things. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a tough question to ask, answer with a short phrase. I termed yeah. that question badly. Sorry. <laughs> um, question. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, quite yeah. better. Um, the appointment of Tristram Hunt to the V&A earlier this year was surprising, and um, I suppose I took from that that he was, you know, stepping down uh, from his role as an MP because he thought he could make more impact uh, to public life as the director of a museum. Do you feel you make more political impact than an MP? <laughs> <laughs> Just a yes/no, if you. <laughs> I think it's about being really clear what our purpose is and the impact that we can make mm -hmm. and then going for it like that. So, you know, absolutely, you know, and, and it's back to us as, you know, what is our social purpose in museums and what impact can each of us make? We all work in different museums, different co collections, different governance, but it's for each of us to think, how do we make the most positive impact yeah. that our organisation possibly can? It can make. Um, uh, by, before I joined the National Trust, I was a civil servant for 30 years. And one of the reasons I decided to make the switch from the mainstream public sector into a big NGO was that the idea which uh, I believe in very strongly that the way society changes, what changes society is a mix of things. Yes, sometimes it's government and politicians 
equally, or perhaps more often, it's movements, it's outstanding individuals, it's NGOs, it's that one experience where you walk into the Castle Museum and you see something. Um, and therefore, politicians and politics has a part to play, but almost all positive social change actually is a range of actors. And I wanted to try being in an organisation which, uh, like mine, has, in, in this instance, reach and can engage public debate and, and just change individuals, people's lives as they walk through our doors and whatever they want to do, enjoy what we do. So um, I think we're all in how we make social change and politics is just a little part of that. I'm going to take that as a yes from the whole party. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Rachel Trent, I recently appointed as the Director for Group for Education in Museums and come and join me for lunch. Um, there's still places, I think. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the future of learning and what your reflections on that is. So we have, we've got very little time left, so, just, so I'm going to have to like n not nominate, but if somebody, does anyone have a particularly <laughs> strong, anyone up for that question rather than all of you? Underpins everything we do, mm. absolutely, and it's not just about space, it's about the whole experience. Every little opportunity in our museum should be about learning. Very interesting, when I arrived at the Trust, we kind of excised the word learning from all our material on the basis that it was kind of patronising to assume you wanted to tell mm. people things. When, uh, when colleagues joined from the museum sector, they say, why don't you talk about learning? It's what museums are all about. So I think we're just kind of, you know, we're at a kind of transitional point where we might yeah, go back there a bit. Yeah, yeah, cool. I think part of how we understand learning is also understanding what um, the visitors and what other people bring mm. into that process because people don't expect just to receive a message now, they expect to kind of co-construct yes. yep. yes. yeah. yes. their understanding. So I think that that points to different directions and ways that we can work. <coughs> Lovely. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Director of Communications for Historic England. We are increasingly interested in the business of placemaking and the role of cultural institutions in placemaking, much like Rain was talking about earlier mm. in York. Um, I suppose my question, we, we need more interpretation in our towns and cities. We've mm. got challenging stuff, we've got fascinating stuff, we're looking at contested statues right now. My question is, what can we do, both as a funder and as a very enthusiastic collaborator, to encourage interpreters to bring, you know, for museum staff to bring their knowledge outdoors and to use the, the cityscape and the townscapes and the stuff they've got outside? Mm. Mm. Well, well, actually, um, we've been working really closely with Historic England uh, in York, and um, particularly uh, one particular member of staff at Historic England who has... Um, I have to admit, I, I completely stole a slide from Historic mm. England where Historic England had gone through the similar process that we've been through about what's the importance of our site. And they had created, you'd, you'd created a visual that had associative, historic, cultural, and all these different ways of categorising. And it was a really neat way of getting across the process of thinking through storylines and so on. So we've already benefited from Historic England um, in that kind of your expertise in framing thinking about sites. Um, and I think the other thing is perhaps just coming and talking to museums, because until um, two, two years ago, we treated our site as a repository for a museum collection, whereas actually the stories of our site are incredible, yeah. and we have to bring the two together. Um, and, and, you know, so I think I'd say just get your people to talk locally and with that passion that we had locally in York, and, and I think people will listen. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we support... Um, uh, the Heritage Open Days, because I think that is one way you can get local communities to engage with their local heritage. And another thing we've done um, uh, is things like um, kind of off our properties, moving to the places where people are rather than where we are. Uh, things like, you know, apps for walks around parts of London, or uh, I think we've done the same thing here in Manchester. So we're very keen to help with that process. Um, so perhaps we should talk afterwards. Um, so I'm being given the uh, wave from the side of the stage, but if you, I mean, if you guys have five minutes, to, there are two people who no, entirely do my poor timekeeping have not got to ask their questions. But if you guys can maybe stick around at the front of the stage and you can come up and say hi and ask your questions then. Lovely. Great. Perfect. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for being such a fabulous audience. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.